to the glory of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. You know, there are those, those scenes in the Gospels that always make it into the Hollywood Jesus movies. And one of them I've never seen is Jesus saying, do you think I've come to bring peace? No, I haven't seen that meet any nice, you know, Hallmark Channel kind of Jesus movie that we watch as we approach Easter or anything can catch us off guard. I, uh, I heard a sermon once at a church called Prince of Peace, and they, this was the gospel reading. He said, well, you know, maybe we should look at uh, changing our name to Prince of Division for our parish. <laughs> Prince of Scorched Earth Parish. What is going on here? Yes, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. No, Jesus is not against the family. What's being divided? What's being burned up? Uh, what, what, what is the circumstance in which we cannot tolerate peace? Well, it's a false peace. It's a false unity. It's a surface level. Everything seems fine, but in the depths, um, there's discord and division and unhealth. We're in a time right now, I think this is particularly identities, like the, the issue that everyone's talking about, right? Like, what are our identities? And, you know, a number of folks have mentioned commenting on our society, and I don't know that this is just the current age. I imagine this has fallen humanity throughout history, but that we seem so easily offended by everything, right? If you criticize my favorite restaurant, well, we can't be friends now, you know? Um, I remember going uh, during an election cycle, uh, my wife and I had an anniversary, went to a bed and breakfast, and the innkeeper was telling us she uh, had a couple of customers, these two guys, they'd been friends 35 years, they met there every summer, and they didn't even talk to each other after that current election cycle. And they went, not just we're having trouble meeting, just game over, you know? Why? Because something had become the center of who they were. Something had become their identity. And so if that was threatened or disagreed with, um, couldn't have a relationship, right? To, to disagree with me on this means to reject me. And then division happens. So that's, that's a division we have to be really careful of. We do have identities. And sometimes if something um, is rejected, then that can make a relationship difficult. It might even be a rejection of who God has made us, but we better be really careful what that is. Where is our identity? What's the thing that's precious that we want to share um, that might cause division if people reject? I'll give you a hint. It's the classic Sunday school answer. <laughs> it's Jesus. It's God. And anything else in that center seat is what the Bible calls an idol. And an idol is something that's sitting in a chair that it shouldn't be sitting in. And that chair we could think this morning of is our heart, right? Where we draw our identity from, where we draw our values and our life from, what keeps us going. And the fire Jesus is talking about, kind of burning, burning, I wish that the earth were set ablaze, is not a fire of destruction for us. It is for some things. It's a fire of purification, so it does destroy. What does it destroy? It destroys things that are themselves destructive. It destroys sin and death, distortion. It burns it up so that we can be free of them. It destroys the idols that are sitting in that chair that, we're not, that they're not supposed to be sitting in so that the chair is emptied out and has space for the one who is supposed to take up that throne in our hearts. What I think this does too is, you know, this, Jesus says, I have a baptism. What's he talking about? He's talking about the cross in which he experiences, steps into death, but not just death, right? A, a heinous, agonizing death on which all of sin, all of pain, everything wrong you've ever done and everything wrong that's ever been done to you is on his shoulders. And then from that, he swallows it up and beats it, right? He, that's Easter. He steps forward with victory over it, so it is no more. 
That's his baptism. And that is the miraculous power and grace that we receive in our own baptism. But baptism is not the end game. It's not, I had a high school buddy who, who was very concerned I was not saved because of the denomination my, my family was a part of. So he really, really wanted me to get saved. And if I had just sat there and said a particular prayer he wanted me to say, that would have been the end of it. He would have been pleased. I would have, you know, that, that was the end game. Accepting Christ, receiving the grace of baptism is the beginning. And from there, we still got a whole lot of life left ahead of us that we have to keep running through, right? And so um, what's so important to live out our baptism, to live out our baptism, is for a Christian to not be an adjective, but a noun. So that you're not a Christian Democrat or a Christian Republican or a Christian American or a Christian attorney. You are a Christian, And there might be other things that qualify you, sure. But the core of what you are and who you are and what you were made to be is a Christian. That's at the heart of it. If that ever becomes an adjective, then something else is becoming the noun. (laughs) Something else is moving to the center. And that's what we have to guard against. That's the constant temptation in this life because there are all sorts of forces and movements and politicians and marketing companies that would love to be the noun that you describe yourself as. But Christ is the center. Christ is the noun. The rest are just adjectives that come and go. And they come and go just like life. Life comes and goes. Things are up and down. Like we were talking about with the kids. There are days when we're running the race of life, like Hebrews talks about, where it is just smooth sailing. And then there are days where you're running, (laughs) somebody said, and you go so fast, and don't you feel like life is just whooshing by and things are great? And then there are times where it is an uphill slog. And sometimes that's for a day, and sometimes that's for a year, and sometimes that's for a decade. And it's just hard. It's just hard, and it's outside of our control. You know, I'm not um, a runner at all. And when I met my wife, she is a runner, or maybe a running Christian, we could say. But she's a runner, and she asked me, as she's trying to figure out, how much do I like this guy? Do I like want to spend the rest of my life with him? Uh, do you run? And I wouldn't say I lied, because I knew that like in Florida, if a gator or a black bear kind of were chasing me, that I could run. Uh, so I didn't say I'm a runner. I just said, sure. Yeah, and I have a very vivid memory of going to Sports Authority after work that week. And that's when I discovered there's a thing called running shoes. I just thought sneakers were sneakers, but no, there's running shoes. And I bought a pair. was shocked how much they cost. They were like two ounces. And uh, and boy, I started running. I met that beautiful girl every day, 5.30 after work, to go running. It's probably the best shape I've ever been in in my life. And there were flat, you know, where sections we'd run, uh, and she got me to run 5Ks. I didn't even think that was like physically possible. I thought people in movies did that, or people in Chicago and Boston. Nope, I ran a 5K, and there were flat sections where you just kind of like could forget what you were enduring (laughs) and think about other things. And then there was the downhill where you were just like, you know, thanking God for his mercy. And then there, you know, the worst thing, I don't know why they do this. If you've ever run a 5K, it's like a cruel thing of of like hazing for the initiation of new runners, where at the very end, they put a hill. Who does that? It's cruel. And you're running uphill. And in Florida, we don't even have hills. But they put a hill there. And you make it. And you make it. And then my wife, because she's a runner, would want to you know, go out to breakfast. And I'd be like, don't give me a cup of water or I might get sick. That's life, right? That's just how it goes. And it's all these things outside our control. You know, the medieval uh, artists of our faith tradition knew this. There's a common uh, image that was in churches in the Middle Ages, and it was called the Wheel of Fortune, right? This is before Vanna White and the guy whose name no one remembers, uh, not Bob Barker. But before Wheel of Fortune was on TV, uh, this was a sacred image, right? And you had this depiction of a circle, 
uh, which, which is like complete and never ending, right? So this is kind of a, an image of perfection and, and eternity. And this is an eternal truth. You've got this guy on top and he's got a crown and he looks like he's got glory and he just says, I am king, right? And then you rotate down the circle kind of to the east point of like the compass point on the circle and he's kind of starting to stumble and it says, I was king, <laughs> And you get to the bottom and he's laid out like he's in a gutter and it just says, I have nothing. And then you come back up to like the west point of the circle and he's climbing. He looks like a guy in like a corporate ladder climb. And he says, I will be king. Right? And this, this is kind of the, the ups and downs of life. Right? And the point is, there's a lot that plays into these things that are beyond our control. We can pursue them. Um, and sometimes we might have the ability to, to make things happen, but things just happen. A life has ups and downs, right? Now, in the center of the image is Christ. And why is this important? If we live on the rim of the circle, we will change with the circumstances of life. Our identity will look like it's changing. Our values may shift. But if we live with Christ at the center, as Hebrew says, if we have our eyes fixed on Christ at all times, that is the still point that doesn't change, that everything else is changing around. It's like the calm of the storm. And in that space, if we can find a way to move to that space, we will have a constancy. We won't change because we'll be anchored to the rock that is Jesus, even when everything else is changing. Now, that doesn't mean our mood won't change. You're allowed to kind of have a, a bad mood on a bad day. But what it means is our identity won't change. Our values won't change. Our hope in God won't change. Our hope that we actually can make it to the end of the race won't leave us when we can't see that line. And that's so important. Um, so it's this brilliant image um, that we can hold on to as we're running this race. Julian of Norwich, great English mystic, has this famous line, all will be well, and all will be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Right? We, can, we can speak that on the hardest days of life with certainty, with peace, because we're at the center where Christ is. Or if you want, we've made him the center of our life. We've given him back the throne in our heart where he belongs. And, and what this reminds us of, it's so important that God became human in Jesus. Hebrews says he ran the race. He, he actually condescended in humility to become human, to run the race. There's nothing the world can throw at you that our Lord hasn't run through, right? And so he runs with you through it. He had a body that got sick. Any of you had COVID this year? Oh my word, I felt sick as a dog, right? He got sick. Maybe not COVID, pre-COVID, whatever was going around first century Palestine those days. Um, he probably got cheated out of some change at a market once, I would bet. You know, got a bad deal. Um, he had friends die. He had friendships get strained. He had grief. He experienced betrayal. He also celebrated. Boy, if the Bible tells us anything, our Lord loves a wedding party. And I love a wedding party. He loved people. He experienced peace. He saw the face of his father. Some of the great saints remind us that he lived at all times what we're destined for, which is to see the face of God. And in this life even, as God himself, he was always fixed on the Father. He lived through all of that, and so we can pray for him. We can join him in the center to run the race with him, to have our eyes fixed on him. Um, and that's a hope. That's a comfort that the incarnation gives us. That's why images of Christ can be so helpful. Preaching, laughing, dying on the cross, resurrecting. These are so helpful to keep our eyes fixed that he's not an idea. God's not like a, re, uh, um, a concept or a value. He's a person that you can have a relationship with who will walk through the stages of life with you, the different um, ups and downs. But how do we do that? Because man, 
We are like sensing people, right? We need to sense things to hold on to them. And if they're out of sight, they get out of mind so quickly. And that's why we latch on to all these other things. We shouldn't be holding on too tightly because we can see them. Marketing people know this, and they love the smartphone and the digital billboard because they can show images at us to distract us. There's a whole science behind it. So we have to flood our senses with Christ. We have to flood our senses with Jesus, reading the scriptures, listening to worship music, looking at sacred art, praying. I mean, even incense, when we have that, incense represents the beauty of the prayers offered to God, right? It just captures us. Having a candle in your home that you light when you get home at the end of the day to remind you, yes, Christ is here. The Holy Spirit is here. And this light is a reminder and a sign of that presence, which is an astounding thing that God dwells in your home, right? So those things can flood our senses and they become rhythms. This is why we Anglicans love liturgy because we're rhythmic human beings, right? We, even have, we have circadian rhythms, we have autonomic systems. So like we're made for rhythm, would you know it? So our worship is rhythmic and it, it kind of retrains the beat of our heart so that our heart starts to beat saying, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, faith, hope, and love, faith, hope, and love, faith, hope, and love, joy, and peace, joy, and peace, joy, and peace, right? And that, when we have those rhythms, when our heart picks up that rhythm of beat, we're moving to the center. We're moving where Christ is fixed and we're anchored to him, and we can keep our eyes on him. Now, the letter to the Hebrews uh, also has this important line that is helpful uh, for us. It talks about the cloud of witnesses, right? What is that? That's the communion of saints that we profess we believe in in the Nicene Creed. These are the brothers and sisters who've gone before us, and their lives are models for us, and they pray for us, the scriptures tell us. So let's look at each of those in turn. Their lives are models for us, right? They show us what to do. You know, another running story. I stopped running about the time that I put a ring on her finger. And uh, she kept running, and I would go cheer her on at the finish line. (laughs) And one, one day she was running with some friends of ours, and it was a trail run, which in Florida, if you're running through tall grass, you're gonna see snakes. And you could see in this long line of hundreds of people, there was a certain point in a field where everyone was just hopping, 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 kind of like gazelles. And so you weren't sure quite what was there, but when you got there, you knew you were going to hop just like they did because they were ahead of you, right? Turned out there was a rattlesnake on the path. You don't want to get bit by one of those. It's kind of like that with the saints. Why do we look at the lives of the saints? They're models for us. Right? And why are they models? Because they kept their eye on the prize. So while they were running, they didn't forget what was coming. A great comedian I saw once, he's trying to get in shape, so he started hitting the treadmill. He said, I hated it. So I just kept my eye on what I was going to reward myself with afterwards when I got home. Lasagna and a nap. Lasagna and a nap. Lasagna and a nap. Right? For us, eternal life with God joy and love and peace, every wound being healed, every relationship that's strained coming back to love and peace. Right? No tears, no dying, just joy. That's the prize. That's what the saints knew. They kept their eyes fixed on Christ for their whole life. And you know what? When we look at all their lives, they lived all over the map of that wheel of fortune. Some were rich, some were kings, some were very poor, some chose poverty, some rotated around it throughout their life, but they all fixed their eyes on Christ. And all those saints, the light of their life is a witness to the light of Christ and heaven, right? So what are we called to be in that way? But a mirror, you know, some of, some of our poets in the Christian tradition describe the saints um, like the moon, that any light coming from them is the sun reflecting off of them, right? So the beauty of the lives of the saints is the life of Christ reflecting in their own life as a witness of what the good life is, what running the race with good form looks like. And we can follow that model faithfully, knowing um, that it's reliable, 
because it's a life that was lived with Christ at the center. And finally, you know, the saints are praying for us. Right? Death no longer has dominion over them because death no longer has dominion over Christ. And they were baptized in Christ and they have experienced new life with Christ. Revelation 5 says, the incense offered before the throne in heaven is our prayers, the prayers of the saints that they too are praying for. They're the brothers and sisters who've gone before us in our family, the way that we pray for one another. You know, I'll never forget Hannah ran my wife a half marathon once. I didn't even know anyone actually did that. I thought that was like a mythical thing. We show up in Boston, Georgia, which is a very small town in the middle of nowhere, for the Boston Mini Marathon, and it's 3.30 in the morning and 20 degrees, which also doesn't happen in Florida. And they go running. And then I had like three hours to go find a cup of coffee. And then I got to the finish line as they're all coming through. But at this particular race, they had not really marked the finish line very clearly. <laughs> and so we're all standing there cheering our loved ones on, and the race runners are coming through, and they're just looking. Like, where is it? <laughs> Where's the finish line? Which, and we're all just pointing. It's over here. It's over here. Come this way. Right? That's something like the prayers of heaven for us. It's over here they're praying. May the Holy Spirit lighten your life. May God's providence put markers out there for you in your life so that you find the right path, the direction to go. Because it's not always clear in this life, right? The Christian life, there's not like a playbook. You know, you can't open up the Bible and, oh, here's Ecclesiastes, and oh, that's the decision to make. Okay, that's not how it works, right? But that's why we have the Holy Spirit in us who speaks to us, which requires listening, which requires moving to the center where the Lord is. And we have a great cloud of witnesses who witness that that's a reliable life to choose, that God is faithful to his promises, and they're praying for us until we join them in the life to come. So wherever you are this week, whether you are just running along, doing laundry and groceries and thinking about other things, or if you got that promotion this week and you're feeling on top of the world, or if it was a slog and you, just a blur, wherever you are, I pray that you run the good race. Run it knowing you're not alone. The Lord is running it with you. And the saints, not just in heaven, but here in this room, are running it with you. And so let's pray for one another and encourage one another, sharing the ways that God is active in our lives. And may that race bring you to the arms of your loving Father who's waiting for you. God bless you.